Good afternoon, folks. Welcome to the Washington County Public Affairs Forum, December 1st, 2014, at the Peppermill Restaurant. Today we have two guests on the program. Our first guest will be Gretchen Beener from Tigard City Council, giving us an update on the council and discussing a few issues. And also afterwards, we're going to have Pete Truax, the mayor of Forest Grove, giving us an update on that community. As a quick reminder, as we have wonderful service here at the Pepper Mill Me Restaurant, please, folks, these guys do a really good job for us every week. Let's not forget to give them a little tip at the end of our time. And without further ado, Gretchen from Tiger City Council. Gretchen Beener, thank you. Good afternoon. Hello. I hope you're having a good day. Um, I have been on the Tired Council for eight years now, and before that I was on the Planning Commission, and before that I was on a bunch of uh, various committees. So I've, one way or the other, I've been involved in Tigard politics for about 20 years. Um, Tigard's been growing, as most of you are aware. We passed the magic 50,000 mark um, this year, which means we have to start playing with the big boys now. The rules are different for cities over 50,000. But today I just wanted to uh, focus on a couple of issues that are really in the forefront of what's going on in Tigard. And the first issue is our uh, urban reserve annexation that came in in the last uh, urban UGB expansion, urban growth boundary expansion, and that is River Terrace. And over here, um, you'll see, this is South Cooper Mountain, for those who are not aware. This is Shoals Ferry Road, and uh, this is River Terrace. It's an area of approximately 500 acres that was brought into the urban growth boundary in a couple of different uh, situations. And it, we have been working on a community plan for the area so that development can begin. Um, this is Roy Rogers, as most of you are probably aware. It's a freeway going through what is now open farmland. Uh, we are looking at having a variety of different kinds of residential zoning so that there'll be all kinds of housing options available from multifamily to traditional uh, single family dwellings. These areas down here and over here are, are uh, in our urban reserve. So at some point in the future, they will be coming into the urban growth boundary as the Beaverton urban growth boundary has moved west to Tile Flat Road, if you know where Tile Flat Road is to the west. It's about two-thirds of a mile west of uh, uh, where Roy Rogers comes out. Uh, this area will have some new streets, a small commercial area, which is unfortunately under <coughs> the, uh, <laughs> the sign. Uh, which will have, be local commercial as opposed to any large commercial development. It'll be somewhat similar to what uh, be, the city of Beaverton is planning for their urban their their uh, uh, new newly annexed area on the north side of Shoals Ferry. The two cities have been working together very very diligently on joint issues, which include um, how all of the stormwater issues are going to be handled, and uh, extension of sewer lines, at least in the northern part of the areas. Uh, it is expected, this used to be what was called urban reserve number 64. This was 63 down here. It is expected that uh, the northern part, or what was 64, will be developing more rapidly than the area to the south because there's fewer uh, topographical issues in terms of putting in the infrastructure. The anticipation is that the plan will be adopted by the Tigard City Council at our last meeting of the year. There'll be a public hearing. We've been working through the various and sundry pieces of the plan. 
Uh, over the last several months, there have been a series of meetings and public hearings. And we'll pull it all together uh, later this month. And the plan is that there'll be bulldozers out there working on infrastructure by the beginning of the next fiscal year, which is July 1. So after J in January, the local developers will be able to start doing their plans, filing applications, et cetera. So we'll, that's what's going on in Tigard in our new area. When it builds out, the expectation is there'll be somewhere close to 15,000 people living in that area. I know. Um, we had a mandate from Metro of an average of 10 units per acre. Unfortunately, a portion of the area to the north of Shoals Ferry got a man mandate for 15 units per acre. So there's going to be a lot of density out there. And one of the big issues is obviously going to be transportation and what kinds of improvements are going to be placed. Most of you are probably aware uh, the county has just, has just about completed a widening uh, Shoals Ferry from Teal out to Roy Rogers. Uh, you can expect over the next few years, since the Beaverton School District is going to be building a new high school here, that they will probably be extending the uh, widening of Shoals Ferry at least past the high school. With that, unless, yeah. Widening to four lanes? Yeah, widening at least the three lanes, probably four lanes to get to deal with the traffic going in and out of the high school, because there's always a lot of traffic going in and out of a high school. Also, eventually, um, there'll be additional, this is Roy Rogers, there'll be additional streets going down into the urban reserve when, when that does come in in the future. There are any, aren't any questions about that? And sure, yeah. Just, just to clarify, Gretchen, that commercial area you said fronts Roy Rogers, no. Oh, that's not, okay. no the, that's not commercial zone there, it looks like. No, there's a commercial zone. Um, it's in the middle. It's moved around two or three oh, times. Yes, okay. Excuse me. Uh, Am I let, causing a problem? No, you're not. But I guess I just wasn't clear. Questions are available for forum members after the presentation. Okay. Let's let Gretchen uh, Beener have her moment to share the information with us first. And then we'll pepper her with a whole bunch of questions. That's why they call it the pepper mill. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to put my other sign on. Sign up here. The other big project that the city's been working on for a number of years is a permanent water source for Tigard, and this is something close to my heart since it, it in, was incentivized me to run for the Tiger Water District Board back in 1995 and was the start of my career in this area. Uh, Tigard, when it was first created, uh, ran off of local wells located on Bull Mountain. However, there were water, change, water rule changes at the state level uh, in, the, in the early 90s that basically shut down uh, most of the wells on the mountain and left Tigard in a situation where it had to get water from elsewhere. Uh, there were a variety of different agreements that were proposed, but none of them came, came to fruition, and so the city was forced to start buying water from the city of Portland, which it's been doing since 1994. Originally, there were two water service areas in the in the, or districts in what is now Tigard and its surrounding communities. Those those were the Tigard Water District and the Metzger Water District, which has now been folded into Tualatin Valley Water District. Approximately two thirds of the city of Tigard is within the old Tigard Water District service area, which pre. It was around long before the city of Tigard was created. And about one-third of the city is in the Tualatin Valley Water District, which has different water issues. And uh, I'm sure you've heard all about their plans or will be hearing about their plans. The, uh, 
Negotiations and searches continued all the way from the mid-1990s, including a proposal to go to the Willamette, which was uh, stopped in 2000. I was actively involved in as a proponent of that from the Water District. And then we looked at the possibility of going in with the, the group that has uh, Beaverton and Hillsboro and the Irrigation District, and I'm forgetting, some, and you guys. Uh, that, that was uh, one of the proposals. There was look, looked into going in with the South Fork Water District, which is West Lynn and, and Oregon City, and we looked into going in with Lake Oswego. Well, eventually, Lake Oswego Council came to realize they were running out of water. They were maxing out their treatment plant, which is located in West Lynn. It was unincorporated Washington or Clackamas County when it was built. Anyway, uh, in 2008, the two cities reached an agreement to share the cost of upgrading the river intake, building a, basically a new water plant, and all of the pipelines, etc., that would re be required to get water for both Lake Oswego and Tiger for the next X number of years and the cost would be shared between the two cities, which would make it cheaper for both cities. Originally, Tigard was supposed to get um, 14 million gallons per day MGD, uh, and the city of Lake Oswego would have 24 for a total of 38. Their current capacity is 16 uh, million gallons per day in the current plant, which has reached the end of its useful life. It's it was open in 1968. So uh, we started the process with years of planning. I, I was on the oversight committee uh, involved in helping to draft the contract, and I've been on it ever since. They, we have two electeds from each of the cities that kind of oversee what's going on in terms of when it was in the design project, what the engineers were coming up with, um, getting contracts proposed, and now the committee is supervising the construction of the project. And let me tell you where we are. We have, we're building a new intake on the Clackamas River, where the, oh, here we are, just above the mouth of the river, right next to the park there, if anybody knows where the Clackamas Park is. It's, the new intake is very close to the old. It will pipe through the city of Gladstone. We've had a great relationship with the city of Gladstone over to Meldrum Bar on the Willamette. It goes under the Willamette River with a pipe with the HDD project, which means they bore a hole under the ground, under the river, and pull a pipe back through to across the river to West Lynn, which is, an, towards Merrillhurst area, um, where the water treatment plant is, and they are literally building a plant while the current plant is operating. So they're building it in pieces. It will be larger, but its footprint will not be much larger than the current plant because of the improvements in technology that have occurred in the last 50 years. The water will then leave in a pipe from West Lynn, proceed down 43 to Lake Oswego. Originally, our plan was to burrow under Lake Oswego uh, to, to uh, deal with the project. Unfortunately, you may have heard about this um, shale oil explosion in North Dakota. Well, the cost of doing uh, that kind of drilling has gone through the roof because they can charge whatever they want if you are drilling in North Dakota. So we did, revised a plan B, which was to go around downtown Lake Oswego to uh, get to B Street. Then it go up B Street through, uh, through Lake Oswego and obviously stopping off to fill their, their reservoirs on the way. We're building a new reservoir next to a, an existing reservoir in Waluga Park, 
most of you know where Waluga Park is. I spent many days watching <coughs> Little League baseball games there. Uh, and then on down and across the freeway to a new pump station on Milton Court, which is right off of Benita. What will be really nice about that pump station is we'll have two pumps to pump to two different elevations because, as you're probably aware, we have significant differences in elevation where you are in Tigard. I live up um, in the zone where I have to get water out of our 700-foot um, <coughs> reservoir. So we'll have a pump station going to two different reservoirs, one to the 440 zone and one to the 550 zone, which will really expedite and make water delivery around the city much more efficient. Now our service area also includes the city of Durham, which is between Tigard and Qualatin. The um, city of King City, which of course is immediately to the south of the city of Tigard, and the unincorporated area up on Bull Mountain. Now, uh, where are we in the process? Well, one of the pipelines going through Lake Oswego is basically done. Um, they're putting the roof on the new reservoir in Waluga Park. Um, the other pipelines except, let's see, I think they've all started except one. They've been bidding them out separately and getting them started. Um, they are working on the pipeline from the intake to uh, Meldrum Bar. They have finished the pipe under the river. They did the pullback about a month ago. It went in 12 hours instead of 48, which is what they had planned. Everything went great, and it came in, that piece came in under budget. So <laughs> that's always great, because the going around Lake Oswego is going to be a little bit more money. So um, the intake, they're going to switch it on sometime in January using the current pipe, which is much smaller, of course, uh, until they get the new pipeline construction finished. The plant is moving along. It's, it's the one thing that's sort of behind schedule, and we're trying to get the, the construction manager to get it moving. But they have finished the clear water, which is where the, the uh, clean water will be stored before it's piped out. And they're um, busily constructing all the other things. They plan to be able to start using water from the plant uh, sometime in early, uh, two early, late 2015, where, you know, it's kind of up in the air, the exact time. Uh, the only thing that won't be finished is the ozone uh, system that is being added, which will help with um, odor and color issues. But that, they'll be finishing that. It, it, that particular procedure can't be done until they finish everything else and can un deconstruct some of the current equipment in order to put the ozone in. So the, the water will start coming without the ozone treatment for a few months. Then the water um, moved to that pipeline. They just started the pipeline on both ends um, on Highway 43. They're working at night. We don't know exactly where they'll meet up, but uh, that's proceeding. And then they, the one area that hasn't been started is the going around Lake Oswego. That hasn't gone out uh, for bid over to B Street because that's the one they had to re-engineer when we had to go to Plan B. They're working on the, on the pipeline up B. Um, and as I said, they've just about finished the one between 10th and uh, the uh, new reservoirs. They'll, they're being connected so that water can go back and forth between the two reservoirs. And then uh, they haven't started the pipeline from the reservoir over to the new Bonita pump station. And we're really excited. Um, we hope to have it uh, oper most of it operating uh, various times next year as the, each piece will start coming online. 2015 came awfully quickly. And 
By the way, I, you know, I've, I've said this to the folks who are working at Tuolumne Valley Water District, you have to start 10 years ahead of when you want a water project to go on. We started in 07 and we're going to have to fight to get it open by, um, for Tiger by J July 1, 2016 because we're finishing our contract with Portland. So it's been an expensive project. It's roughly 255 million or between 250 and 255 million is the is the price and it stayed pretty much what everybody estimated um, because some things have been less expensive and some things have been more expensive and with that unless someone has questions I'm done Gretchen, thank you very very much and hang on here we, uh, I think we're going to have a few questions here and just as a reminder Questions are for forum members only. Please identify yourself at the microphone. And short questions are great. We have a good eight to 10 minutes um, left for questions. And thanks again. I'm Bill Kroger, a member of the forum. Thank you for coming today. I uh, kind of wonder about 20 years ago if you'd even thought you'd be talking about water plants and pipes and things. But you're very knowledgeable, so I appreciate your coming and doing this. My question concerns the development up at Roy Rogers and Schultz Ferry. You know, they're doing a lot of work to expand that area and improve the roads and things. But my concern is downstream, you know, down around Washington Square and in, in I-217. You know, and I was kind of wondering if you on this council discussed this and if you see any potential solution for all the horrible traffic that's going to be starting up there. Well, um, yes. It's, I'm sort of a tiger tri a transportation junkie on the other side of my life. Um, yes, we've discussed it ad nauseum. And quite frankly, um, most of you are, are aware, uh, 99W is the most heavily traveled road in the Northwest that isn't a freeway in terms of the number of cars per day. So this has been a long-standing issue, and uh, we continue to work on various proposals, and hopefully we'll get um, some kind of rapid transit to get out to the Tigard area to help take some of the load off of the highway. Uh, we're not going to get rid of the folks are coming through. Half the traffic is coming from Sherwood, Newburgh, et cetera. Um, but yes, I'm very aware of it, and we've been working on it, trying to get help in terms of coord coordination with the county, the state, ODOT, um, and hopefully some federal grants. Thank you. Chris Leslie, former member. I understand you're a member of the National League of Cities, and you were awarded a silver certificate. Would you tell us about that? Well, actually, it was um, platinum. I've gotten a silver before, but uh, they, there's an education program through the National League of Cities that uh, gives classes on how to be a better city councilor or mayor. And they go from such uh, basic issues as how to budget and um, uh, how to do audits to more esoteric, how to do outreach to the community, how to um, get catalyst programs going, how to uh, plan for major development, etc. I started taking classes when I first got elected, and they have a certain, when you've taken so many classes in this wide variety of areas, you get points or credits, and you go through bronze, silver, um, uh, gold, and then, and then platinum. And so I got my platinum award last spring. And the classes have really helped me in terms of being a better counselor. I can't strongly advise anyone who thinks about being a city counselor, take the classes, they're wonderful. Harry Bodine, for a member. Uh, Gretchen, I'm a, a resident of the Tualatin Valley Water District, and this district is currently building the water line from the Willamette which will not be on the line by 2016, but you're talking about 135 million gallons per day capacity. And uh, I'm curious about the, the comparison in costs between T-17 
TBWD and your, your Tiger Lake Oswego project, what is your, <coughs> how do the rates compare? The, and also, uh, Talton Valley does not levy a property tax for anything at this point. Is this a, a property tax free project? Um, well, our, yes, it's all based on rates and, uh, and eventually system development charges, SDCs. Um, yes, well, one of the things that's really interesting, some of you may have remembered there was this little event in 2007, 2008 when the economy tanked and uh, certain companies uh, uh, got in real trouble. Uh, municipal bond insurance used to be written by most of those company, by one of those companies, and there, was, there were no muni bonds issued for a couple of years. But under new rules, they started in 2010. And under the new rules, uh, the city of, or the Tiger, or Lake Oswego Partnership had to provide the filing. They had to have new rates to support the costs in place for a minimum of 12 months before they could go on the bond, out in the bond market. They had to basically put a year's worth of, pre, of the uh, payments on the bonds in a savings account and leave it there for um, the duration to pay the final year of the bond off. And third, um, have a 20% cushion above what your, your cost of operations and paying the bonds was worth. So it, our bond rate gurus, I'm not a, a mathematician, I don't do that kind of work, basically said we had to provide, um, basically double our rates over a few years. And so the first year, because we had to do all of that at the beginning, we had a 30% rate increase. We've had 14% in rate increases the sub subsequent years. And one thing I didn't mention during my talk is we did a deal and bought four more MGD from Lake Oswego, so we're going to have to tweak our rates again one, one time. Um, but then we stopped paying rent to the city of, of Portland for their water, so uh, rates will then be relatively flat except for inflation and if we're building our reserves again. In terms of that's what I anticipate that the that the uh, Tualatin Valley Water District is doing as well. So it'll be all rate driven and SDCs. The, luckily, they're in a situation where the economy's better. We couldn't count on any SDCs for the first couple of years. We have time for just one more question, but with any luck, uh, hopefully Gretchen will be able to stay and sure. be available at the end. Thank you. One more question, please. Thank you. Hi, Gretchen. Marilyn McWilliams, for our member. I have a pretty easy question, I hope. You talked about the HDD drilling under the, the Willamette mm -hmm. River and then um, the, the tunneling in Lake Oswego. Can you explain why those are different, why it's so much more difficult to do the tunneling? Well, it's the same process. The, the, pr <coughs> the problem was because the cost, we went out for bid, and um, the costs were just astronomical and so it was not financially feasible to, con to try to do the uh, drilling under the lake and we knew it was going to be more expensive to go around um, around the city but uh, originally it would have been cheaper to go under the lake but then as I said because of the uh, drilling boom in North Dakota the rates were just out of sight Thank you very much, Gretchen. Appreciate it. And thank you so much for hanging out a little bit. Next on our agenda, we have with us the mayor of Forest Grove, Peter Truax, who will fill us in a little bit on what's going on in that community. Mr. Truax. Don't applaud just yet. You haven't heard what I'm going to say, so. <laughs> Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, it's not often that I am before you to tell you of the good things that are going on in Forest Grove and in Washington County, and it's not often that I get to share uh, the lectern with, uh, with Gretchen. I have had the uh, great opportunity of working with her 
uh, directly and indirectly in Washington County politics, Washington County government, Washington County issues for the past 14 years or so since I have been on city council and joined uh, Forest Grove in 2000 as somewhat of a neophyte. She was one of the people that gave me an opportunity that gave me a little bit of education. You talk about the National League of Cities education. It's also the education you learn from the rest of your uh, colleagues on various city councils and and other municipal governments around the area that is important. And I wanted to make sure that uh, you knew that uh, here in Washington County, I can't say the same thing for our neighbors to the south and east of us, who shall remain nameless, but um, here in Washington County, well, I feel we have a fairly good working relationship with virtually everybody in the, in, in, in the county. First, I would like to share a couple of observations on the recently concluded election. I won my mayoral race in Forest Grove by 107 votes. I lay that narrow margin to a couple of things. One, I was an incumbent. Now, we all know there's a general feeling of throw the rascals out. That's primarily at the federal level. It's, been, it's bled down to the state house and now finally oozed onto the local level. In the past, it was a case of throwing the other guy's rascal out. Mine is just fine, thank you very much. But this year, we saw some of our incumbents involuntarily taking the exit ramp. We've seen that at the federal level in a number of states, in our own state and the legislature, and locally, I saw two examples of that. One in West Lynn, where Councillor Jody Carson was denied another term, and that is unfortunate for the metropolitan area. And Wade Byers was defeated in a bid to remain Gladstone's mayor, equally unfortunate for the metropolitan area. And in those cases, as well as throughout our state, we saw the pervasive presence of out-of-state money. It is one thing. It is one thing to have individuals in this state spend their hard-earned dollars on a particular cause or a particular candidate. That's a First Amendment right. However, it's something else entirely when money comes from beyond the continental divide in an effort to simply buy an election. And we had that example again in Oregon. Second, in my own race, I ran an absolutely horrid campaign. <laughs> and I did so because I neglected social media. I don't do Facebook. And I don't tweet. I didn't believe I would ever say that sentence in my lifetime. But <laughs> My opponent did and gained crucial ground. My animus towards Facebook and all the rest of that social media is the anonymity it affords people. I don't mind being criticized for stands I have taken and votes I have cast and people I have supported. I do mind it when those criticisms come from someone with the name redneck and proud of it or hashtag drop dead. I also mind it when the anonymous individual makes threats. But my absence from that discussion on the social media hurt me a great deal. I still operated on the premise unfortunately, which is losing more and more validity, that the voter's pamphlet is the most important document voters use in making elective decisions. I think that changed, and it will continue to change. The voters also took the opportunity to use their ballot to complain about two issues our council acted upon this past year. One was island annexation, and I'm sure some new involuntary residents of Forest Grove took it out on the incumbents. The second issue was backyard burning. We acted on that, but may have lost some popularity on both sides. We went too far, or we didn't go far enough. More on that issue later. But I won, and I have the chance to make good on some hopes and dreams I have for Forest Grove. I do want to congratulate those in the Forest Grove mayoral and councilor races in running campaigns which in large part dealt with issues and philosophies not personalities, attacks, or innuendo. So the campaign's over. And unlike other cities and governments, our change of electeds took place at the end of November, as soon as Washington County recertified the results. 
That means I've already been sworn in for my second full term as mayor, and that school teacher Melinda Wenzel is now on the, the city council succeeding Camille Miller. So what now? So what do we do in Forest Grove? We have transportation needs to address and road projects to complete. Our intersection of state highways 47 and 8 will be improved at the cost of some $4 million. Adding left turn lanes, improving turning radiuses, or is it radii, I'm not sure, uh, are just two ways this will move people and freight through that most important of intersections in western Washington County, while at the same time improving pedestrian and bike access and visibility. We're also involved in putting David Hill Road through eastbound to Highway 47 and improving uh, the east-west connectivity in the Grove. North of the city, again on 47, we were instrumental in developing a process to improve the intersection of Verbort and Purden Roads. Work on that deadly intersection will begin soon. Parenthetically, you may or may not be aware that that intersection was the scene of a horrific accident which took the lives of two Pacific University students uh, a little over a year ago. Again on 47 on the southern edge, still within the city limits, we're working with ODOT, CPO 15, Clean Water Services, Forest Grove Schools, and many other partners, both public and private, to find a solution to issues created at yet another intersection on that highway, this one where Maple Street and Fern Hill Road meet and cross Highway 47. And with our island annexation of a year ago, remember I talked about that? We have the responsibility to improve those county roads now fully within the city. We need to take them over and bring them up to city standards. Our new sustainability commission is already at work on projects. It weighed in on our recent backyard burning ban. We didn't ban it outright. But there are limits which allow burning in the spring and that's it. There will be no fall burning anymore. I've also indicated that this is a stop along the way. This is not the end result. Sooner or later, sooner or later, burning will go up in smoke. Uh, sorry about that. Our Sustainability Commission will be looking at ways to deal with sustainability with respect to the environment, the economy, and social fairness. We have to do it. We have to do it because it's the right thing, and it's that simple. On a personal note, later this month, I begin my one-year term as president of the League of Oregon Cities. With the Oregon legislature convening this odd-numbered year, I expect that the League will be playing a role looking out for the interest of Oregon's 242 cities and well over half of the state's residents who call a city, any city, their home. I look forward to that challenge especially with regard to much-needed tax reform, getting a grip on recreational marijuana, and there are a bunch of puns I could have used there but will not, working on improving mental health programs in cooperation with the state and with Oregon's counties, developing a funding program designed to meet Oregon's transportation needs, and making sure that each city is able to properly maintain and develop its use of the right-of-way. Those are five priorities of the League. That's not to say we won't be worrying in on other issues, notably water and wastewater treatment, veterans' rights, and homelessness. So it's a big agenda. It does become more coordinated and a little bit easier when I find that these items are also on the agendas of various cities, including Forest Grove and other cities throughout the state of Oregon and Washington County. I am proud of what we have accomplished in Forest Grove since 2000 when I was first elected as a city councilor and as, as Forest Grove's mayor. I'm also proud that I had the opportunity to work with former Mayor Richard Kidd, who is now, after a two-year hiatus, back on city council and sits to my right and tells me when I'm making <laughs> mistakes. I'm also proud of what we've done since I became mayor, but in the words of Robert Frost, we have promises to keep and miles to go before we sleep. I close with a small story I learned from my good friend Dave Willard, 
Dave was the assistant superintendent of the school district when I was a teacher in Forest Grove. His story is one I've used in various forums this fall, and it is as follows. The Maasai are an extremely warlike nation in Africa. But when their warriors greet each other, the greeting is a most unwarlike question. And how are the children? They ask this question because it's crucial to them, these warriors, their mates, their families, that the children be nurtured, that the children be cared for, for if they are, then all is well. The future is secure, and the Maasai will continue as a viable member of society, as a viable member of culture. So it stands to reason that the only answer that is acceptable to this people known for their courage, their devotion to duty, and respect for their heritage, the only answer to that question, and how are the children, is their children are well. And our answer, which will be developed over the years, over the next four years and the four years after that, for children we have and for children we have yet to see. We may never forget the question, how are the children? May we always answer, the children are well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Truex. We have a good 10 minutes for questions. And remember, questions are for forum members only. Please keep them brief. And I thank you, and I believe we have a question right now. Mayor Truex, yes, thank John. you so much for being here, and I do appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> transportation <clears throat> from um, the metro area as it gets, goes out towards Forest Grove. A lot of people are wanting to go to work, and are there needing other boats of transportation. How are things going with some kind of communication with TriMet to maybe get some light rail uh, or uh, trolley car or some, some kind of form of rail out to Forest Grove from maybe Hillsboro? Well, in, in 2000, when I ran for city council, my voters' pamphlet statement indicated that I would like to see that TriMet push max, the max line out the six miles from Hatfield Government Station out to Forest Grove. In the intervening 14 years, I've learned two things. One, you don't always get what you want. And two, sometimes your agenda gets a little bit bigger and you have to put things on, on the side to get some other things accomplished. I think that's one of the realisms of, of, of politics, of local government, of any government. And I also learned that you get from A to B through a variety of processes. And while we don't have the max line that, that Richard also worked on while he was mayor, and that we're both still very, very interested in, we did some other things. We have another counselor on the Forest Grove City Council, Ron Thompson, who was tireless in his work to establish a neighborhood transportation system that coordinates very well with Line 57, the Forest Grove TriMet line going into Hillsboro and on into the Beaverton Transit Center. And this thing was called GroveLink, and it's a, it's a fare box free transportation service with two loops around the city of Forest Grove, providing those people with first mile, last mile uh, transportation. We're still working. We have a grant for two years. Uh, we're about halfway through it, a little over halfway through it. We have, in the process, more funding coming through that we will be able to continue it. But we continue with a serious discussion on how to improve that to see if there's going to be a desire from the people who use the system to put some skin in the game, maybe some fare box revenues. We'll see. But this, while it's not max, and while it's not a, a rail line into Forest Grove, it does improve the transportation network in the city. So I guess the short answer is, beats me when Max will come to Forest Grove. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, Phil Nelson, forum member, and thank you for your delightful and informative talk. Thank you. Uh, years ago, I was city attorney of uh, Grants Pass, and uh, we were uh, very much tied into the League of Oregon Cities, and I was very impressed with the work that the League did. And 
want to congratulate you, of course, on your position as president of the League, which is a critically important institution, I feel, in the state of Oregon. And I wonder, in regard to the League, if you have any position or the organization is going to take a position on climate change. You know, we talk about clean water and such as that, uh, the kind of the ground forces of uh, the climate change movement, but is there anything specific that the League has assumed or will be doing in regard to climate change? I can't, I can't speak to specifics. I can speak to an overall philosophy that um, climate change is something we're going to have to deal with. If anybody wants to, wants to think that climate change is not an issue that we will have to address, uh, that train's already left the station. So uh, we will be having that conversation. We've had it in general terms. I can't recall specifically what we're going to do to address it, but there are, um, in the back of my mind, there are some 20 uh, priorities that the League was looking at. We put, I've highlighted the five that we put at the top of the list, but those other 15 uh, deal with those kinds of issues. I can't be specific right now, I apologize, but uh, it would be my effort to get us to focus on that and to carry that conversation also with our state legislature. Thank you for the question. Eric Squires, for a member. Uh, first, thanks for being here. I really appreciate your articulate and wonderful overview. Uh, second, a brief comment, and I think that Grove Link was an outstanding uh, step in the right direction for Forest Grove to signal that it is willing to take on its problems and solve it themselves uh, versus waiting for TriMet to become involved. <clears throat> My question for you is this. One of my guilty pleasures is reading the Oregonian, and Forest Grove has had the Forest Grove uh, police blotter um, uh, published uh, repeatedly in the Oregonian, and the behavior on the of, edge, as I recall, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's it's become quite the media spectacle. And I'm curious if you have an opinion, or if that just speaks to your wisdom that uh, you can maintain power in such a crazy town. Uh, do you have any comments about the, the Oregonian's uh, police blotter publication? Um, First of all, Forest Grove's not crazy. Um, uh, we have a sense of, of self that is, we are able to poke fun at ourselves and enjoy life in Forest Grove. And the police blotter, which is the work of police captain Mike Herb, is, is one, of the, one of the ways in which we do it. Uh, I have heard more than one comment about that. I've also seen that there have been stories in the national media about Forest Grove's police blotter. Um, uh, some of the stuff I read and I say, you know, this has to be true because nobody could think this up on their own. Um, and uh, it's just, I think, an indication of those things that make Forest Grove somewhat a special place, that we are able to take these incidents, uh, put them in uh, a light of a little bit of humor and say, you know, we're able, to, we're able to laugh at ourselves and we're able to point out some human foibles. Notice that we do not treat any of those serious incidents in Forest Grove that occur that our police and fire and uh, rescue people need to be involved in. Those never make the police blotter as far as being humorous. There is nothing, there is nothing fun about an incident of police having to answer a domestic disturbance complaint and having to discharge their weapons. Um, there is no humor to be found in any of those kinds of things. Uh, we don't, we, and we tr work very hard at making sure that that nexus does not get crossed. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Leslie, board member. Thank you, Mayor. The idea of uh, expanding populations and overpopulation and traffic. Can you address those problems? And what are your uh, numbers for a complete city of Forest Grove? The indications that I've heard, and I'll um, defer to Richard on this, but I, when, when he was mayor, uh, I think the overall build out was around 35,000. We are now at 22,000. This last year, we were the sixth fastest growing city in the state of Oregon. Um, we cannot, 
and nor can any other city, Tigard, Tualatin, Lake Oswego, pull up the drawbridge and say, we have enough, no more people are coming into this region. You know, the, the prediction is that we're going to have another million people in this area by 2050. And that's the four county area. That includes Clark County and Vancouver as well as the, the three counties in, 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 or in, in metropolitan Portland. We got to find a place for them. We have to find a place for them to live. We have to find a place for them to work. We have to find a place for them to enjoy their leisure time. Uh, we have to do all of these things, and we have to do it on a budget that sometimes gets stretched to the breaking point. Uh, that's one of the reasons why the league is taking a look at uh, honest-to-God tax reform uh, this time around in Salem and, and going to try and hold somebody's feet to the fire as to making sure that that system, it's not so much that we can get more money, but that we can be more efficient with it and that we can be fair with it. Uh, as far as growth, again, we have, uh, if you look at the figures, we're at about 13,000. We just approved a um, planned residential development in Forest Grove that's going to add another 190 homes. It was not without a little bit of fire and a little bit of brimstone. But we need to do that. We need to play a role with the rest of the cities in Metro to do those kinds of things to offer uh, affordable places, to offer a mix of housing, and to make sure that that affordability and that that mix is available throughout uh, the Portland metropolitan area. It's not going to be an easy question. You've asked a very good one. Uh, we're going to probably be answering that uh, for the next, uh, beyond my term of office. Thank you. Portland General Electric. Uh, Mark Freibert, forum member, who I happen to work there. Good to see you again. <laughs> I uh, just wanted to uh, elaborate a little more on transportation as well. Uh, Councillor Beener mentioned the superhighway Roy Rogers effect. Uh, we, the highway you mentioned going north and south from Forest Grove, what do you foresee as its future, <laughs> especially as the county looks at uh, west side options? Part of me says that would probably be a very good road use as the basis for a west side connector uh, from south of south of Wilsonville um, towards the Columbia. I think if we were to do that we would be looking at another bridge across the Columbia. Um, and we need to do something. Obviously, you you raised a good point. We have to get those goods from uh, Hillsboro and Points West uh, to the airport, uh, to the rail yards in, in, in North Portland. And we have to do it in a way that is safe and efficient. It is not safe and is not efficient to move them through the tunnel. Obviously, some of those things cannot move through the tunnel under the West Hills. So we need to uh, look at doing something with either Highway 47 or Cornelius Pass Road to straighten it out to get it down to Highway 30 so that we can, again, move people, move freight in more than one, uh, um, one major network street. Um, the studies being done, um, I think it's a good, if we were to bite the bullet and go towards something like that, it would be on a cost that I would think be similar to the CRC and it would take approximately 10 to 15 years to get done. So uh, I'm not saying let's start tomorrow, but we need to continue that serious conversation. Thank you. Thank you. John Hutzler, forum member. Um, in the uh, November election, Washington County voters also approved an amendment to the county charter that will, um, that will uh, require redistricting of commissioner districts on a more frequent basis and, and uh, establish narrower limits uh, for the equality of those districts. Um, for each of the speakers, do you, do you anticipate any impact on your cities or do you expect that the growth of cities will simply force those adjustments to be made in the unincorporated areas bordering, uh, the bordering commissioner districts? 
Well, Gretch, if you want to come on up here and we can tag team on this. I don't see any change in uh, in Forest Grove in particular. Uh, we are, I won't say far enough out there, but we are far enough out there that Bob Terry's District 4 will probably remain Forest Grove's district uh, on into the foreseeable future. I don't think the dividing lines will get out there. Uh, I do like the idea of making the numbers a little bit uh, closer together so that uh, while we're not going to get exactly four districts equal in population, at least they'll be closer. And I do also like the idea of making uh, the readjustments more often because that, again, is an issue of transparency and reacting to voter needs. I don't see any significant change in the short run, um, but the growth patterns, I think, as we go out a few years, are going to see more and more development in South County, um, as opposed to North County, which once the, the uh, South Hillsboro development gets built, probably going to be pretty much um, most of what's going to happen north of Cooper Mountain. I see eventually, I think Roy's district is going to have to shrink to respond to that um, demographic change. I think the biggest change is going to be in the uh, areas around uh, Greg Malinowski's district and Dick Scott, and I think they are going to move back and forth. I think that's a that's a huge volatile area there, and I don't mean volatile in the negative sense, but it's going to move back and forth from redistricting to redistricting. I also think the, the tremendous growth that we're going to see in South Beaverton is really going to change how things, um, um, you know, where those lines are going to be down the road, given that, that they haven't brought in all the line, all of the land out to... Uh, um, tile flat now, but I see over the next 20 years probably everything on the south side of Bull Mountain, or uh, excuse me, Cooper Mountain, out to tile flat is probably going to come in and probably develop pretty quickly because it's easy for folks to get from there to uh, Nike or Intel, or hopefully uh, Tiger will put some more employment land in what is now its urban reserves, so uh, the need's going to be there. Ladies and gentlemen, just a moment to thank Councillor uh, Thank you. <laughs> I'm so sorry. To thank Councillor Beener from Tigard and to thank Mayor Truex for their time. I know we have at least one more question, but this is the end of our televised program for the Washington County Public Affairs Forum, December 1st. And I'd like to just take a moment to let folks at home, as well as uh, watching on cable access TV, as well as everybody here know that next week we have a, quite an innovative program. There will be three communities in Washington County represented to talk about prevention. And we have, again, a longtime Washington County Public Affairs Forum who is now a published author who will be revealing the surprise ending of his book. And actually, he doesn't know that. He really won't be revealing the surprise ending. But we'll be learning a great deal from Mr. Kroger next week as well. Again, this is the Washington County Public Affairs Forum for Monday, December 1st. And I thank you very much, and I thank our guests very much. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. So I appreciated um, both of your stories today, and they were more than stories. They were, they were telling us about uh, what's going on and the realities of life. Uh, my my question um, is about uh, Forest Grove and the fact that it is a college town, and you have a really nice college here. And, and my concern is uh, well, it's not a concern. It's it's an area of interest, really, and that's the relationship that you have working with the president of the college so that it makes the college be able to be able to grow and, and function within the city at the same time that you're running a wonderful city. So could you comment on that? Um, two things. One, I'm glad you brought that up. One, Pacific University is the only four-year degree-granting institution in all of Washington County. Um, I, to my understanding, Wilsonville will say that there's a branch of OIT there somewhere in that particular community, but um, 
I'm not going to go any further than that. Uh, but, but Pacific uh, and Forest Grove have, have a tension, and that tension is very, very healthy. It keeps us both, I won't say it keeps us both awake at nights, but occasionally we do toss and turn. Um, we work well together. Uh, sometimes we have opposite aims. Uh, when the university decided to move their bookstore back onto campus, um, I howled a little bit because it would have meant it means another empty store on Pacific Avenue in Forest Grove. I didn't like that, and I made no bones about it. And they said they understood that, but they needed to have a profit center on campus, and they needed to to have the bookstore make money. It was losing money in in the community. Needed to go out uh, back onto campus. Um, we needed to work together to get more community support and more community attendance at that bookstore. That just didn't work out. So that's a, that's a, that's a little example sometimes of the tension. Where things work well together, uh, we are working on our sustainability programs almost hand in glove. We are working together on transportation issues around the city. Uh, their, their alternate transportation, pedestrian and bikes, are playing a role in our pedestrian and bike programs in, in Forest Grove. And we're also relying on uh, the university as a research center. We're using students as uh, interns in both the city and in school district uh, for uh, various uh, activities and various, various missions. So there is a, there is a, a combination, there is a partnership uh, with the university and, and with Forest Grove. We did use our bonding capabilities. We've done it a number of times in allowing them to build buildings in Hillsboro at their health professions campus. We did get a little pushback on that when, when Richard was mayor, but uh, the reason that we did it was that this serves the region. And if we're going to think regionally, we'd better act regionally. We'd better not only talk the talk, but walk the walk. We did that. It's been nothing but successful, obviously, for Hillsboro, but it's also been successful for Forest Grove. Last but not least, when they brought back football, that was a huge, huge program. Some people might say, football, you know, practice. No, football. It was uh, an important um, recruiting tool for the university. It also was one of the things that they were looking at when they paid for the redevelopment of Lincoln Park, which is now a jewel in not only in Forest Grove, but in the state of Oregon. So uh, we have a great uh, respect and partnership with the university. Uh, it's been built over the last 10 years. It'll be built uh, in even better in the next 10 years. And I not only am proud to be a Pacific graduate, but also very glad I'm the mayor of Forest Grove working with a fine university like Pacific. Thank you. I know there were a couple other questions that weren't able to be answered, though I will let the mayor know we have a growing branch of Linfield in Tigard. <laughs> <laughs> there are about a, a thousand students studying at our, our branch, and it's growing. That's a branch, right? Not, <laughs> not the world headquarters. No, like no, no. no. <laughs> But I know there were a couple people who had questions, and maybe they left. So I'll just make one more comment on the transportation question that was asked. Uh, Tigard has been taking a very proactive uh, role in terms of trying to address our very difficult transportation problems that exist. And uh, the first was working with money from the county, the state, the feds, and our own money to rebuild the Hall and uh, Greenberg Road intersections that go into downtown. Uh, that has made a tremendous difference in traffic flow on 99W. Uh, we are getting ready to start construction on rebuild of the intersection of uh, McDonald and Guardian, the two different names, same road, on 99 that will be starting next year. Uh, it will be adding turn lanes and um, making the intersection work much, much better than it does now. The theory being that if you can make the cross traffic process much more efficient, you're going to end up having more time for green light 
on 99W uh, to make the large traffic flow work better. Incidentally, they'll be straightening that intersection, which is currently not a nice square intersection. So that's going to make things easier. That is our highest place for traffic accidents in the city. Uh, we are continuing to look at other kinds of road, imp road improvements. Um, the extension of Murray, connecting it with uh, Walnut at Barrows Road, has uh, changed some of the traffic patterns going through town. And we continue to work on projects that we can tweak the transportation to hopefully buy us some time until some kind of rapid um, transit can come to fruition. It's, it's a major project and we keep taking little bites and we'll continue to do so. That's one of the reasons that <clears throat> the city enacted its uh, local gas tax, which is dedicated to working on specific difficult transportation projects. And as I say, we're still paying off the, uh, the bond, short-term bond that we sold to fund the Greenberg project, but we'll be selling another little bond to fund uh, doing the uh, McDonald Guardy project. And that's what that tax is going for. And our residents are very happy that we continue to take little bites at the problem and we'll move ahead. Term expires. Yes. Twelve thirty one. Yes, I'm what going off count. Your plans? Um well, they're a little uncertain. There's been a lot of uh, issues going on in my family that this will give me a little additional time to deal with. And there's always the possibility I may run for office again in two years. But we have term limits in Tiger that you can only serve two terms. So we'll see what happens. Thank you. We have not seen or heard the last of Gretchen Boehner in local politics. She's a, she's a valuable contribution to the community at large beyond the borders of Tiger. And I've served with Tom from Forest Grove on the uh, uh, League of Oregon Cities Tax Committee for many years. And uh, that committee does Trojan amount of work uh, in the off year working on what, what are viable options for looking at tweaking our tax system that would work, be fairer for everyone. So I, I can't um, highly enough commend the work that the tax committee, transportation, land use committees do down at the league. It's a lot of hard work and they get paid the big bucks to do it, as we all do. 